you very much. So what do you think is the only guarantee in professional sports? We cannot guarantee that athletes are going to make the team, even if they work hard. We can't guarantee that they're going to become an Olympian or a big champion. We definitely can't guarantee that they're going to earn a lot of money and have a wonderful long career. If you think about it, the only guarantee in sports is that it will end. As coach Pete Carroll from the Seattle Seahawks tells his players all the time, you live in a temporary fairy tale. So why is this important? Well, I'm a sports psychologist and you know, when I started off my practice, of course I was interested in performance and helping people to reach their dreams. But I became more and more uncomfortable with this idea of saying to them at the end of their careers, okay, goodbye and enjoy the rest of your life. <laughs> Especially when I knew some of the challenges from my own life, from my friends who's working in the athletes that I work with now. So I think it really is important that we reframe and rethink this idea of retirement and how are we going to better prepare athletes for this inevitable transition? And research backs this up, whether it is rugby, soccer, cricket, Olympic codes, NBA, uh, NFL, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter what gender you are, what country you're from. The vast majority of athletes really struggle with this transition from elite level sport into, what's a better word, normal life, <laughs> normal everyday life. And a really interesting statistic that comes out of the research is that around about half of elite athletes retire earlier than they think that they will. So often you'll hear, you know what, I'll think about one day, Kristen. <laughs> you know, when I get closer to my retirement, then I'll prepare for it. Well, actually we know now that you're not actually guaranteed of anything. You don't know when you're going to retire. So what are some of the challenges that athletes face? Well, they're kind of common themes. We look at five common themes and how we can maybe help athletes with these. The first one is this idea of new dreams. If you think about being able to, <laughs> what dream lives up to the childhood dream of being an Olympic champion or a Springbok rugby player? These are incredibly emotive dreams. And now you have to try and find something else for the rest of your life. And I've yet to meet an athlete when they come and see me to say, Kirsten, we really dream of being a psychologist, <laughs> but I also want to be an Olympian. Like, it's always that sporting dream first. And athletes battle with even what am I good at? So we often talk about dream careers. So we encourage athletes while they're competing to also study and think about something else. But I think we really need to talk about dream dreams. It's wonderful to want to be an Olympian or a Springbok rugby player. It's a wonderful dream to have. But we have to encourage them to have another dream for their life as well. And then there's this issue of identity, which is, <laughs> who am I? You know as an athlete exactly who you are, you've probably been told from very young who you are, because if you think about it, athletes from you're kind of six, seven, eight, you start seeing that they're good, and they start, you know, so you're the athlete, you're the rugby player, you're the swimmer. Sometimes people wouldn't even know my name, but they'd be like, oh, you're the swimmer. And it's easy for athletes to become wrapped up in this one identity. And unfortunately for their self-worth then as well, to become attached to the performance of just being an athlete. They fail to explore other parts of themselves. So we have to also start helping athletes to see that they are more than an athlete. There's other aspects of themselves. And yes, while you're competing, you might not be able to explore all those fully because your time does need to be, um, you know, in your training, in your competition, you might know, train up to six, seven hours a day. But just in the back of their heads to remind themselves that you are more than this. A friend of mine, she said, I was just someone with her, and she said, you know, Kirsten, I confused who I am with what I did. And I kept thinking that without swimming, I had nothing of true value to offer the world or society. And she said, even my 10 years after her last competitive race, that was something that she still battled with. Another thing athletes struggle with this is loss of structure. It's probably one of the most jarring aspects of retirement. And a lot of us would have probably felt this during, um, during COVID, actually. <laughs> I spoke with Phil Singer, the final, the final legend, Phil Singer, and he had to stop because he had double knee surgery and knee replacements. And he just said, you know, waking up, figuring out what you want to do every day, he said, what's in theory, that sounds so easy, but in practice, it's not. Especially, he said, when all you really want to do is play soccer. And I think that's the point. At least really, a lot of it, what they want to do is just still be swimming, still be playing. But their lives are very structured. 
how the coach will tell them what to do, or managers will tell them where to be and what's good. And also, if you know I want to make Paris Olympic Games or LA 2028, it's very set out for you. And once you know that, you can kind of work back and the structure is very much linked to your goals. If you have no goals or new dreams, let's say, how do you create a structure then for yourself? And in the beginning, it's amazing. <laughs> the first maybe three, four weeks, maybe two months of your retirement, it's incredible. You get to wake up late, you get to stay up on Friday night, um, you get to go on holidays that you don't normally get to go on. And it's, the sense of freedom is amazing, but it very quickly turns into a sense of being limbo. So one of the things we really have to help athletes with is they're setting these new goals so they can create the structure around them. Then there's finances, which kind of speaks with your talk as well. I mean, there's some terrifying statistics of the amount of athletes that have severe financial difficulty or bankrupt within a very short space of time after retirement. And I spoke with Ryan Mitchell, he's a 14 times world boxing champion. And he said, you know, by the time he was 50, he was a multimillionaire. But by the time he was 32, he was well on his way to bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, you think that boxing are often rags to riches stories. But he said, it's not. It's rags to riches back to rags again. As my business partner always likes to say, it's somewhat easy to make money, but to keep it is <laughs> something a little bit different. And athletes tend to, uh, when they are performing, they really want to have the best sports psychologist, the best tired dietitian, the best coach. But somehow, when it comes to their own finances and business, they tend to trust themselves or just trust, trust the wrong people. You know, friend of a friend of a friend. So we have to also help them to understand who can you really trust with your finances. And just sometimes basic financial literacy as well. Then there's the new normal. Um, I think our workers said, you know, every day that they looked in the mirror, their body was changing. And it was no <laughs> longer muscular like an athlete. So it was just a reminder that they were no longer that, and now they were just an ordinary Joe Slope. And normal life can feel very, very normal for athletes. Because if you think about it, what they do is not normal. I mean, how many of you spend six hours a day with your head in the water? <laughs> Most people are not going to do that. You know, or just the amount of training, the amount of traveling. And so this adjustment to what normal life actually is, and then on top of that, which links to identity as well, the general public have very short memories. And I worked with a rugby player once, and he said he was about two or three months after he retired, he went back to the stadium because he wanted to watch, and he saw this kid ran towards him. And he was like, oh, this is great. They're going to come and ask my autograph. And he went straight past him. <laughs> and he turned around, and there was one of the new players in the team that they were going to get. So just this, again, this ordinary guy, and how do you put that on? And how do you manage that? Well, I think... What we have to do is, is reframe this idea of retirement, and hopefully in this for all of us that go through transitions, because we all do um, in our lives, and leave certain identities and move on to new things. Because athletes often see retirement as a peak point. So they're working towards something, and then it's an end. And it's often tied with this idea, strangely enough, with quitting or with giving up. Often I'll hear people say, you know, I'm thinking of giving up. And they can feel incredibly guilty about that because especially when they feel like they could continue and people around them are going, it's such a waste of talent, you should just keep going. And it's not. Sometimes you get to the point where your priorities just shift and change and it's actually understanding that at that point in your life, there's something else that is just more important, that you judge to be more important. So it's not a peak end point. I think we have to think of it more like a kaleidoscope kind of. I don't know if any of you played with a kaleidoscope when you were younger, but it's like a, um, like a telescope, binoculars if you look down, and it's got this beautiful picture. And then you twist and you turn it, and the little crystals change, the light changes, and there is a beautiful new picture that emerges. And I think we need to think about transition like this. Yes, there is a twisting and a turning, and it's not always easy, but there is a new picture, and that's the beauty of it. It's not the same, it's different, but it's not worse. And we have to help athletes also see that it can be more meaningful in some ways. A lot of, well, you are not going to probably find the same thrill as running out onto a field and having 80,000 people cheer for you <laughs> in, in really a normal life, or touching the wall and seeing that you look the gold medalist. I mean, let's be fair, like very few times in life are you going to get that absolute thrill. 
But life after sport can be every bit, if not more so, meaningful for athletes as they contribute to their families' lives, to their community, and to society as a whole. And Roger Bannister, who was the first person to break the four minute mile, very famous for that. But some of you might not know he was also a neurologist. And at the end of his life, he said, I'm more proud of my neurology achievements than I am of my athletic ones. And what a wonderful message to have for athletes that, you know, be all in, and we want you to pursue this dream. But to know that you can have other dreams and ambitions that can be, in a sense, more meaningful. And I said, for all of us, I think there's a lesson in that. And ultimately, what we're saying is that we want athletes from going to trying to be the best in the world to being the best for the world. 